a welcome to today's Tuesday talk on planetary health, reimagining human health in the Anthropocene by Nicole de Paula. Nicole is the inaugural Klaus Töpfer Sustainability Fellow at the ISS in Potsdam and has a background in international relations. She has been working over the past decade at the interface of policymaking and research to create public understanding and specifically in this regard on the topics related to sustainability, environment and public health. Prior to her time in Germany, she has been working among others at the John Hopkins University in the United States, the London School of Economics, and at a think tank at Mayadol University in Thailand. Furthermore, she is the founder and executive director of the Women's Leaders Planet, Women Leaders Network, no, Women Leaders Planetary Health Network. I'm very sorry. Um, just before we start, two quick announcements. First, as mentioned, as usual, we record the session. Second, Nicole has a next appointment, next meeting directly after. So we stop a bit early today around at 2.45. And therefore I do not want to waste any further time. Nicole, please. Hi everyone, so good to see you. At least it's a good point of uh, contact here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I just, since we are also recording, I can leave a message uh, for other colleagues who are not here today. And it was an absolute pleasure to spend uh, this year and many months with ISS. And I have to thank the, of course, the fellow unit and, and all the directors and all the colleagues because it's been such a, it was a difficult year for everybody, but I think we were so lucky to have this space to continue, you know, uh, reflecting on those important questions and exchanging ideas and actually not suffering so much from, from that perspective. So thank you for this. Um, I will share my screen now and I have well, what I'll do is actually have a conversation about one of the things that I um, I think this fellowship for um, during uh, the Klaus Topher Fellowship gave me the opportunity to really uh, start this, um, not start, but continue um, my interest in what I had in planetary health and uh, this studying a bit uh, deeper, but also do uh, a lot of fun things on the side. So that's something that uh, I will share with you today. Uh, let me just see. I know, uh -huh. maybe I'll put you smaller here so I'm not so lonely. That's okay. So, all right. Let me just, okay. So what is interesting, especially, of course, being from Brazil, right? We are in a very special moment and we have a president that is creating a lot of trouble uh, during this pandemic, uh, President Bolsonaro and, and, and here our uh, ministry of, uh, they say, anti-environment. Uh, and of course, a little bit of this, uh, the context that uh, when I started studying planetary health at ISS, it was a little bit of what is that, sounds this very esoteric term. Uh, and, and then uh, the pandemic came and became, now I see uh, the topic expanding so fast, but also the politics around this, uh, um, not shifting necessarily, but uh, playing an even bigger role, which makes me even more excited to uh, continue this uh, studying and acting in this area, because of course, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, but uh, a political scientist. And, and then we see with this example how important it is to bring you know, the policy side to this discussion. And there was it's a very interesting uh, quote here is in Portuguese, but it's saying if Brazil finds a solution uh, to itself, it's going to save the rest of the world. So uh, we are in the, the French philosopher uh, Bruno Latour, who was also at Sciences Po when I was uh, studying uh, during my PhD. Um, of course, we have now this are date from yesterday. Almost three million people um, already, you know, unfortunately dying um, because of this pandemic. And the, the real question was how we can use this moment and with COVID-19 really uh, magnifying this so many crises together, the healthcare uh, crisis, is the social inequality, economic inequalities and um, weak healthcare systems. Um, but how this discussion of sustainable development uh, can really connect these issues and address human health challenges. So that's one of the things that um, uh, I'm passionate about and, and making these connections, that's the most important part. So one key message that we always now for the last two years with, actually for me, the last five, six years, I've been uh, working on this um, key message here, which is sounds simple, but today was very hard to, to perhaps to spread the word about how human health in the Anthropocene is so linked to the health of our environment. Um, but it was interesting, if you see here, um, the idea itself, of course, it's we should be careful to say, perhaps the name of planetary health is a little bit new. We have 
six years. Uh, but um, the idea we have in the 72 already in the Stockholm Declaration and Action Plan at the UN, uh, already the first time where we kind of see in the international document recognizing the right to a healthy environment. And here just some uh, data when we use uh, this health environment nexus has been neglected for too long because although it seems a new thing uh, in a new area, it's, it was something that was there for a long time in many um, ecologists and other professionals already trying to make these links. And it's just to give you some numbers of these uh, reports, for example, with the World Health Organization, the United Nations Environment Program, saying that nearly 25% of all global deaths are related to these economic decisions affecting the environment. We have a, a number that is becoming famous, but it's even more than 7 million people die every year for uh, um, prematurely from poor air quality and of course water quality also a problem with 3.5 million premature deaths. Um, chemical exposure also with can cost nearly one trillion uh, dollars in um, uh, problems in neuro de neurodevelopment effects and middle and low income countries. And we could also bring this idea of the problem of microplastics, nutri nutrient excess from farm runoff and connecting to the problem of antimicrobial resistance, uh, zoonotic disease is something that I will discuss a little bit later. So what we see is that despite this scientific warnings, uh, we have neglected uh, these connections. And specifically also it's interesting to discuss because of context of COVID, how the area of infectious disease transmission is particularly uh, relevant for this discussion. Um, we see, uh, for example, scientists estimated that three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases uh, in people come from animals. So planetary health for me is really this, um, what I've fell a bit in love with the thing is it's a refined way to think about public health in the Anthropocene is a much more holistic and complete. Um, as, as I mentioned, has this roots in ecology systems thinking um, and the history of environmental movement. Uh, you could also trace how uh, the anti-nuclear uh, activists were very much um, connecting um, the dots there. Um, but the concept of planetary health really gained more attention uh, in 2015 with the launch of this famous report of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet Commission on Planetary Health that gave a lot of force uh, to create a little bit of field. So this, uh, I have three key matters. And the second one is that this planetary health is really about addressing the root causes of unsustainable development, right? Um, we are, um, I, there is this quote from UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres saying, and it seems to be very real now, how does humanity is waging war on nature? This is suicide and nature always strikes back and is already doing so with growing force and fur. And we seem to be living in this moment when nature is striking back. Um, to put this into context specifically of biodiversity and ecosystem service, uh, when you have these reports from IPBS alerting that a million species face extinction, and of course the primary cause being loss and degradation of the natural systems. Um, and, and bringing this to the, the topic of zoonotic diseases outbreaks like COVID-19, we know that wildest pathogens, um, they are responsible for this uh, spillover. Uh, they are in the wildlife, but they really uh, reach us and affect our societies because it's, it's, it's connecting entirely with this uh, driven human activities. So the risk is really, for example, in, when you have expanding cities in areas of forests or expanding agriculture, and, and just this contact is becoming much more uh, common. As um, other experts uh, in this area, so we have more than a million virus out there, uh, no. So we really cannot predict exactly, but we need to be aware of these connections, right? So, um, and the solution when we're seeing now is not only stop this war on nature, but how do we now restore our nature? Um, and what is interesting, one of the key message and we're trying to transfer to policymakers is nature is really an antidote against pandemics. So if you want to talk about prevention of pandemics, it's not only about developing the next vaccine, vaccine but we really need to protect this basis of our healthy life. Um, and just to give you a number here, IPBS estimates that the annual cost of these zoonotic diseases um, is in excess of one trillion, which is really what we're paying today. It's much more than if you could put 78 or, nine, or 91 billion, um, it's an estimate from OECD to protect biodiversity. So it will be much cheaper to do that. And uh, these are other, um, some other numbers that uh, I find uh, quite interesting here, how prevention is 
cost effective. Um, in, the, in the case of uh, such as disease monitoring, retained forest cover, reductions in interspecies transmissions, of course, regulation of the wild meat trade and illegal wildlife in general, uh, we could maybe we would need this 22 to 30 billion annually uh, to take care of these problems, which is significantly less again of this eight to $10 trillion. And these are number four uh, from 2020 that we're gonna have to pay to cope with the problems with the pandemic. So, um, and the same is the same logic of, uh, is valid also for the health savings from policies that could reduce air pollution um, that are also projected around uh, $23 trillion. So these are examples that we want to, of course, study more and combine this information and spread uh, how important it is to, um, to act for, um, for people and the planet. And I would just like to share, this is a book that came out um, last year, Planetary Health, Protecting Nature to Protect Ourselves. And is really uh, giving many, uh, framing the field um, further now that we existed uh, five years later uh, and giving many examples that I would highly recommend if you want to know more about this. Bringing back to climate change, what I find also interesting is how we have um, this new public, right? It's just uh, interesting how the medical doctors are also engaging now with this uh, conversation at the, at the policy level at the UN. This is a, a slide coming from um, a group of advocates, a medical uh, doctors who are messaging already for COP26. Uh, and of course, we wanna say that climate change is one of the greatest threats to public health. There are many direct and indirect effects here. Just this illustrates on not going detail of every um, aspect here, but it's just showing, for example, um, a lot of problems with extreme weather events, of course, causing more injuries, fatalities, a lot of impacts on mental health. Uh, so connecting also with social factors, the ecology of mosquitoes, vector-borne diseases um, also changing. So we have, we're seeing now new diseases is impacting um, or happening in areas that didn't happen before before. Um, um, so these are some very clear examples that how rising temperature, rising sea levels, and increasing weather um, um, events, extreme weather events, can impact our health. This again, also this uh, messaging uh, from how, again, it would cost us much more than we could just simply uh, prevent by, by, for example, shifting subsidies uh, that we give to fossil fuels to improve our healthcare systems. Um, what is uh, also interesting here is that um, although I was talking about climate change, what I particularly like about planetary health is how we can uh, make it a much more holistic narrative about sustainability in general. Uh, I do believe there is this uh, mismatch or asymmetry of power of whatever climate advocacy or even science in general. While when you see in terms of biodiversity and, and the ecology, how things are so connected that perhaps we were missing something before. And, and, and we need to address new uh, resources to these other areas that seemed a little bit um, uh, little less powerful. Um, so of course, um, what is challenging still is that these narratives of well-being still doesn't support this, the importance of, of, of this narrative of decarbonized societies, right? Uh, academically, I think it's very important to, of course, we know why is it important, um, but the way we see what we value, what is a successful career and the values that we see around in our societies, they do not uh, support so much uh, the uh, decarbonization of our economic activities. So the public perception urgency is, is still low and no, not mainstream. And one of the things that I truly enjoy also in my work is actually going to other communities to talk about this and not only uh, talking within our own bubbles, because of course we are all know much more aware um, of these issues. And of course, vested interests that delay action. So. I would say that this planetary health is really that how we go beyond the pills, beyond the vaccines and focus on prevention. And time is truly everything. It's almost like this rainbow. We, need, we have this few seconds to take a photo here. So um, uh, what I was interested in, one of the first texts that I wrote for ISS uh, last year, the very, the, I think the first weeks of the pandemic was how COVID-19 is a chance to rethink these rules of reality. Um, and planetary health narrative recognized that this key solutions to a healthy life are not necessarily in a hospital. So we need dysfunctional democracies. We need leaders accountability. We need partnerships. Um, and uh, finally, is this planetary health requires overcoming the systemic social barriers um, that, uh, that could accelerate this uh, green and fair recovery. 
what I like to highlight, and that connects to the work that I was able to develop because of ISS and this platform that I had, is I don't call it a recession, we are in a she session at the moment. Uh, COVID-19 has only really exacerbated so many of the problems that we already knew about social stagnation, impacting women disproportionately, uh, and of course making this um, long existing gender pay gap um, that we saw, and there were some numbers from the World Bank uh, this year already. Um, what was interesting also how to women were the first ones to lose their jobs during this uh, pandemic, a lot connected to the sector of informality and here this number is like um so they lost 54 percent of this pandemic related job losses uh and even though we still represent 39 percent of the global workforce and to give you another example 2.3 million women left the workforce altogether and this is only in the us i think we can in other countries we might not even have these numbers and gives you an idea uh, of this she session problem that we are seeing uh, and 70 percent um, of the people now who are in, uh, suffering from hunger uh, chronically hungry uh, are women and girls so there are so many of this topics are interconnected but impacting uh, women disproportionately in other vulnerable groups. Uh, we see that before the pandemic already uh, this was a problem with the UN. We had many numbers here also. What we see is that uh, women continue to be discriminated legally and the UN shows that in, in 155 countries at least one law exists that can uh, uh, put women in a different uh, difficult position economically. Um, the gender pay gap costs the global economy 160 trillion. And again, what another key message that we want, and in my work, I'm trying to say is, is not that we want to empower women or then create another type of inequality. It's just how much of these inequalities leave everybody behind. Uh, and it, I find this fascinating that, for example, only with the problem of domestic violence, how we have the size, what are we losing is kind of the size of the economy of Canada. So there's very powerful um, problems that we are suffering. And the pandemic, again, is almost like shedding light on these issues that we already knew. And the topic of, for example, even domestic uh, and sexual violence uh, became very, very, very important and, and visible. So I like this photo, even though it's a very nice photo here of these women. Uh, when we say we are in this together, the resources to prevent, respond, and recover from the pandemic are incredibly different. And we had a lot of these discussions, what we call the global south in our fellow unit. Uh, but also when you bring, again, this dimension, the gender dimension, it's really kind of illustrates how we're navigating these problems. But the good news is that uh, with the fellowship, what I truly enjoyed that I could indeed create this Women Leaders for Planetary Health. They started as a network and uh, we launched this at the Climate COP uh, in 2019 with uh, the ISS space there. And it uh, was uh, very interesting to see how now we are actually a, a, a formal organization in Berlin. It's a social enterprise uh, there. We're going to continue trying to do. So I think we're the first in the world who actually thought about this issue. How do we connect health, environment, and gender? So talking about breaking the silos for planetary health and all how we need to integrate it was still it's still very hard to combine all these topics although this, the connections seem very obvious for people who work but uh it's, it's it's still challenging to see how our um for example ministries are so divided that they don't see these connections but we continue um then working a lot to spread this knowledge build knowledge uh through blogs we have webinars and and, and the typical activities of uh, awareness raising, but also empowering women more concretely. And one thing that was very interesting, when I joined ISS, I had an interview and they said, what do you want to do with your fellowship? And I said, I want to do three things. And one was, I want to continue a book on planetary health. Second, I want to do, I want to empower women for planetary health, but I didn't know exactly what that mean. Uh, and, and then finally, I want to support Brazil um, to do um, to also raise awareness about planetary health. So I'm very glad that after the kind of the end of this journey, almost uh, with ISS, I was able to uh, do this three things. And we launched this mentorship program with the Women Leaders of Planetary Health. And we received a lot of applications. We had 150 applicants uh, who joined us. We could select only 23. And we are really focusing on this low and middle income countries participants. Uh, I was very surprised of how much uh, support I got from people around the world, very busy people who, who wanted to be a mentor. And we're all volunteering our time here. And what happened is that we spent five months and we became kind of a 
active network of doers of around 60 people. And this came around, it was just, you know, an idea that I, uh, I could do during the, the, co, uh, the reflection space dialogue. I'm not sure if I get in the full name there, but uh, it was nice to see how a small conversation between, we have a, a lot of people there actually, I gotta say 20 people, and we became a, a large, uh, we are present in more than 20 countries now with, uh, through the mentees. Uh, many success stories there. Uh, the mentorship program, we did a, a short evaluation saying that 100% of mentees want to stay involved with us. So I think it was very useful uh, for the group. Out of 23, I would say that 18 were very successful. Uh, of course, you never had 100% uh, on this. And we launched, I think we're, we've been sharing some of the publications and, and media appearances that we got as well. This at uh, the Lancet uh, was very interesting for us. It's a planetary health blind spot, the untapped potential of women to safeguard nature and human res resilience in low and mid-income countries. So I think we shared this with our network. And we also organized a very large uh, summit in December. We're now preparing for the second and we had the presence of former ministers, um, the CEOs, finance advisors. Uh, the idea was really to mix uh, people also from the private sector, think tanks, academic, and it was very uh, interesting exercise. So in sum, I really think uh, the planter have bring this vision to multi-solve so many challenges that we have, right? We don't have the luxury to keep addressing one uh, challenge at a time. Uh, I would like to invite you all for this. Um, I said it's my third thing that I could do during my time is supporting with the Planetary Health Alliance uh, that is uh, Harvard-based and the University of Sao Paulo. This meeting that will take place during, we create a Planetary Health Week, uh, 20, uh, last week of April. And the title is really Planetary Health for All, Bridging Communities to Achieve the Great Transition. And one of the things, and this Bridging Communities was proud to say, I think was a bit my idea in that sense, because what I perceive is how separate these communities are. Even, you know, people who are advocating for gender, they don't want to talk about environment. They don't want to talk about health. So I think we need to uh, combine all these uh, issues. And moving forward, I'm very glad that I could be, I'm now a scientific commissioner in this new Lancet Pathfinder initiative um, that is uh, chaired by three uh, people here. This is Professor Andy Haynes, um, uh, uh, Joy uh, Pumipi, she's uh, an officer from the World Health Organization, and Helen Clark, former prime minister of New Zealand. And we are uh, now uh, really creating a new report a little bit like the Planetary Health Lancet one, but focusing on the benefits for health through um, decarbonization, really focusing on mitigation activities and how this concretely impact human health. So we, we made a call for case studies. If you have something, I can also share the link for, for that as well. Um, closing, I remember I, I mentioned Bruno Latour at the beginning, uh, and I like this quote also when he said, there's no greater intellectual crime than to address with the equipment of an older period the challenge of the present one. So um, this is our website here. We are actually building a new one. So pretty soon we're gonna have even an even better uh, website, but I would of course, happy to continue this conversation with all of you. Thank you so much. You Thank you so much, Nicole, for this overview and to be so perfectly on time. Having said that, if you would like to have a question, please either raise your hand or write into the chat that you have a question. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we do not have a full hour today, so please make the questions then and comments brief. And I see Mark already, please. Hello, Nicole. Thank you very much for that nice, wonderful overview of what you've been up to. I'm sorry I came in two or three minutes late for it, so I didn't quite catch the very beginning, but uh, I got I get the gist very well. So. Uh, very much congratulations on, on being able to tie so many things together. And it was really, it was nice also to see implicitly on the papers, the, the people that were co-authors with some of this work. I know that you've really, really tied together work with, with Katie and with Maka and Catherine and others at the Institute um, working very closely to you. So thanks for all that you've contributed over this time. It's been, it's been really great. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work together with you, especially with, since you've got the, the Women Leaders for Planetary Health Initiative kicked off the ground so nicely. Um, just one, well, you asked about the, the reflection and dialogue space. So the proper name is co-creative reflection and dialogue space, which we all pretend <laughs> as we go along. But uh, it was really great that that, um, that space could actually offer exactly what you needed for that meeting. And um, I think you know that you won the award for the most crowded stuffed in people in the room for that. We had, the, I think, 20, you had 20, almost 25 people in our 20 square meters. So that was, that was a fabulous meeting uh, kickoff for it. 
The question that I have for you is um, early on in the talk, you mentioned a study that's uh, from 2020. So it's, of course, these are all very approximate studies, but it talks about the cost of the pandemic and listed at 8 trillion, uh, about 8 trillion euros or dollars or whatever at that level, it doesn't matter. Um, my question is, to the extent that you know it, what does that include? And especially, does it include the kind of social costs that you talked about later? So the, the, to me, the, the fact that, um, we, that it works so much against gender equality and that it leaves women in a, a sort of a, a despicable position over much longer periods of time. It's not just the immediate economic consequences of the first years, but once they've lost their jobs and been put into a worse position, that can last a lifetime. Um, even if they've not been sick through the pandemic, just through that. To what extent do you, is that included in such estimates of costs of pandemics? And if not, is there any way to go about giving any kind of an estimate of that in a, in a way that people would respect the numbers um, since, since people, money talks, so to speak? <laughs> I just make a comment and that's a very good question, Mark. And thank you so much. Uh, I also would like to thank you um, personally for all your support. And, and that space was uh, definitely be before the pandemic, right? 20 people in 23 square meters. Uh, there was uh, no two meters to abstand, is that correct? So uh, there was a very, it, and it was a work of, of pollinating, you know, bringing people together at the COP. Everyone was so busy. So I was very happy that from the beginning we could connect many different people. And your support was so crucial. Crucial, and, uh, and you're now one of our advisors. So thank you for being so uh, engaged. Um, and, and I was also very glad that I wouldn't be able to do this if we didn't have uh, Katie, Catherine, and Maka at the beginning, also from ISS, because, and I remember clearly when I said, look, I have this idea, and we, but I would only move forward if we, are you supporting this, even if it morally at the beginning, and now they actually work very hard. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, for the numbers, this, it's, I don't think I have the, the best answer because um, money talks and we are in search of papers who give you uh, some sort of numbers, right? And this was a very interesting one uh, in 2020, some group at Harvard and uh, some connections, um, but I'm sure they're not probably accounting for uh, uh, these other things. And, and the impact, it's so new what we are also seeing. And because I'm not an expert on this, I would like to understand exactly how they're coming up with these numbers. It's like every time you put these numbers and the exercise that we had in biodiversity, for example, the TIB, uh, I will not remember the whole uh, name also, the, but economics of biodiversity. 10 years ago, we were trying to price nature, right? And what are, what are the value of, of the services? And then it seemed that we had a really, um, um, a lot of philosophical discussions as well, because a lot of people said we could not put a price on this and we should not put a price on this. And we kind of moved back. And I see that nowadays, if you want to talk to politicians, you need to bring the numbers back again. So uh, it's kind of a cyclical thing that we keep repeating some of the, the, the work. And uh, the movement now is to show, because we have concrete numbers through um, this recovery package, for example, we know how, how much money countries are including injecting in, in the economy. But when you are, for example, mobilized for the Green Climate Fund, you know, this 100 billion uh, periods, we are not there. We were so behind with so many numbers. Um, so I'm actually curious. Uh, I would like to see uh, more in details, and maybe you can help with that, uh, uh, about the methodology. Uh, and specifically, I just had a policy brief that we could also give some numbers there, and I shared uh, with you all. But even this prices, how do you say that it's um, 1.5 trillion, for example, in cost of domestic violence? Violence. That's one of, there are many numbers there, right? So um, the challenge is how do you make them more meaningful? And that's something that I would, I would like to do. Um, and if you find also a new work that can give some answers of that, I'm very happy uh, to, to find. But th these ones that I used, it was, uh, I used because they were connecting exactly with studies of how to prevent pandemics. And they were probably analyzing more of this wildlife trade or biodiversity issues and I'm sure they were not taking into consideration these other issues, which then would be even more, right? But the main point for me was it's considerably cheaper uh, to do these preventive uh, measures and how much we are paying now. So that would be my reaction. I hope I gave some ideas. Yeah, very good, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Nicole and Mark. I saw that Carlos has raised his hand. Yes. Uh 
Hello, everyone. Um, Nicole, congratulations uh, for everything you have done. Uh, amazing. And um, I'll be back to you with your email about the webinar. And uh, I would like to see uh, two things um, um, during your experience in work on planetary health. How you see the connections between the, these uh, uh, role, uh, whole new narrative uh, in association with the uh, indigenous peoples and, and the, their engagement on this? Because if you speak with someone of the indigenous leaders worldwide, they, they might not uh, even uh, mentioned the expression planetary health, but they are speaking about that all the time. And um, for example, um, recently I, I listened once again to uh, Ayuton Kranak's uh, uh, speech and um, the connection with the river that was uh, damaged by the uh, mining uh, waste. And uh, it's it's all, all there, but I would like to see that. And also the connection between the planetary health and human rights issues, because uh, some of the uh, in developing nations, the the, the drivers of uh, destruction of the of, uh, by the of ecosystems destructions is usually uh, also a driver of uh, um, violation of human rights. Thank you. Hi, Kellers, thank you so much. And you see, I keep sending emails, putting everyone into. <laughs> so thanks for trying to engage you all. Um, and yeah, so you raised two very essential, important topics. And first on the indigenous knowledge. And that's something um, when we say, uh, we need to be very careful when you say planetary health is a new topic. And uh, we have a lot of people, specifically colleagues, also what we call from the global south. Uh, we are much more sensitive uh, to that. Uh, and I saw a lot of, change and more opening for these discussions because we had individuals, it's still a community. And as in many other topics, right? You have to start somewhere. So it's sort of a community and we have very uh, engaged um, indigenous peoples, you know, academics um, mostly. And, uh, and actually the, the name is also Nicole. So we have two Nicoles in, uh, in this community working uh, for that. And uh, she's a very strong advocate uh, and putting this into perspective. So just to give a concrete example, we are now doing, and I opened this an invitation, we're doing a Sao Paulo declaration for planetary health. So in that meeting, and there is now this week, I'm moderating um, the global consultation on that. And when I read the declaration, I actually was, telling my other colleagues that there is a lot on indigenous. I was not against, but I, I was just also, we need to be careful that this is not an indigenous uh, declaration, right? It, it just needed a, a little bit of balance there. But just to give an example, how powerful the advocacy uh, was there. And, and, and there are many papers and books now discussing. We also organized an event with her. The YouTube video is live, I can send it to you. Uh, because if from the pers indigenous uh, knowledge perspective, of course, there's nothing new there. It was it, it's it's an issue of power, right? So we went there, we destroyed everything, uh, and now we want to save what is rest. But it's a little bit of a truth, and it and it's a, a difficult debate. Um, Brazilian in Brazil, we're in a, even more because you're connecting, of course, with human rights. And if you're in cities or if you're not connected academically to this topic, at the beginning, not everybody understands these links, right? They say, well, why do you need to protect, you know, this huge amount because of, I don't know, 100 people? Uh, uh, so you need to demonstrate how they are the guardians of our, you know, the little that is there and that we could save. Uh, indigenous populations are essential uh, to make us to protect what is rest and, 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 and we could, yeah. So it's not an easy conversation. And I see also for Brazilian, I've been to events, for example, the COP. Um, and again, when you are speaking in English, it's indigenous groups, they're much more effective, right? They can go and, and navigate and, and make their um, lobbying work in this text. While in Brazil, it's still, it's very hard. They are very now, uh, they have a moral authority and it's very strong. But I've been to events, for example, where they, there was no translation. It's an international thing. There's no trans. So it's again, power, right? So we need to, once we connect to the right people with the right organizations, we also need to empower the right causes. And that's what also makes me happy with um, the women leaders is that it, it's valid for all these areas, uh, you know, and we just need to connect the dots and empower them to also have their voices heard uh, 
where power is as well, because of course alone they cannot uh, do anything. On the human rights, what I'm also seeing over the, the community of some colleagues, because of pressure we are putting on this discussions of Global South and the paper on Lancet we wrote, because we talk about women, but when you talk about women from the Global South, it's like almost nobody is at the decision-making table. And that's what we're talking about. It's not only disparity, it's about the leadership, the real leadership of women. Uh, and it was an example uh, just in the US, even when you have more women uh, uh, on the board of companies, how they could see a, a, a relation with the increase of use of renewables, for example. So there are many discussions out there that I'm exploring myself, the literature, what exactly uh, could we say about uh, female leadership that um, improves and helps planetary health? Or when we talk about electing women, right? We could say, is it maybe it's not that women are better, but perhaps the societies that they're in are a bit more open uh, for this uh, equality and discussion. So the human rights is also a very important topic that um, I would like even to explore more. And you could also connect to the issues of conflict and security and forced migrations and refugees and all that. So a very important topic. Yes, and usually it's uh, uh, affecting much more women than, uh, than, than men. In many cases, in many, many regions, uh, yeah. together with all the effects of COVID and the effects of climate change and everything. Thank you. Where I'm, I'm now supervising a master thesis of a woman who is uh, doing actually a lot of this uh, refugees and you know human rights and uh, and climate change, focusing on women. So that will be also uh, interesting. We're kind of gathering literature there, and I'll be happy to share this work uh, soon in June. Thanks. I have Barbara next on my list. Please. Thank you. Um, I've hugely enjoyed your talk and all the subjects you've raised. And I've listened to it from a time perspective. And I was wondering how some of these subjects would look different or bring out different issues if you made the temporal explicit in it. And to me, systemic means that you're combining space time and matter at the very minimum. And so the time element is as equal as planetary when normally when you think about planetary, you think vast space, all of the space. When you think planetary, the equivalent of planetary set temporally, then you go from the most fast and the most intricate and the most now to that vast space, both past and future. And if, if I just come to your point about urgency, systemic could be having to think the systemic urgency together with its vast extension. So you constantly thinking the systemic time, space, and matter. And it, I think it would be a wonderful exercise once to just think that talk through again and think how it would change if you made it explicit, the whole temporal and the rhythmicity of how all these different temporalities are superimposed upon each other, impact each other, um, yeah, interact and so forth. Thank you, Barbara. This is, I must say also, when I read your papers and books of, with uh, months ago, when we were discussing, we had also a workshop together. It's, it's fascinating. And I actually would, would be very interested to discuss with you how we could explore that. And when I reading um, your work, it was, you know, it also makes you stop and think, that's what makes sense because it's the complexity and then of course it, it, it urgency but i don't have a, a precise answer and i would um i would like to explore more this and um but just to now i'm thinking out loud but when i thinking about other topics or you know astrophysics and all this spatial and the universe then you go back and said what are we talking about because it, it doesn't temper the te then the temporality in if you really extend it's just it's nothingness that we are talking about but i think it's this tension between 
almost real knowledge and complexity and, and the philosophical, ethical dimension we need to bring. And the pressure of making this, you know, digestive uh, points of the argument to kind of the advocacy work. So this, this, there is a tension there probably uh, that I see. Uh, and, and I like both exercises. So it would be very interesting. I don't know when you make, they would be different for urgency. I don't know exactly what you mean. So perhaps you could uh, ex explain that a little bit. Well, you said um, the problem is that urgency is low mm -hmm. and um, that the vested interests delay action. Well, it's not just that urgency is low. It is also that the further away a problem is temporarily, the less it touches you personally. How do you feel connected to something that will impact eons away, and yet it will mean the end of the world as we know it? Yeah, it's that the, the, knowing yourself to be intimately connected to the now and that long-term future. So you need the urgency, but also at the same time, knowing if you're a systemic thinker, you need to think also that vastness together with the now in every yeah. project. And the same with the scales, you, you go from the macro to, to the micro and they need to be thought as one. And it, it just makes it so much more complicated or complex, but if we don't think the temporal into space and matter, then there's a whole dimension missing. And I think that that is something that would be really exciting to think further on that wonderful work that you're doing. For sure, and thank you for that. Very open for this conversation. One thought that I had when listening to your comment now is also when we had COVID, I think this temporality shift, and that was uh, the most interesting part of the pandemic for me is that it's not as long-term. You, you're, you're, it's not that we are informing people about planetary health challenges, they're feeling the problem of, of planetary health. Uh, now we're just trying making a better work, explaining the connections. And I mean, I have to study this also. And I see global leaders that everybody wants now to talk to us because they want to understand how exactly this is connected. So the now is present in the uh, in this planetary health community. And that's the interesting part because uh, in the same with climate when you have natural disasters, we bring this to, to the now and the temporality is not this more prevention, something in the future. So and I feel we have a little bit of this connection uh, currently happening. And that's what gives us um, some hope that, uh, and that's a problem of memory, right? Even though we, we see a lot of discussion, but perhaps in 10 years, uh, uh, then we forget and, and things become business as usual in a different, and specifically if you bring digitalization, you know, and how, the, the borders of this will completely change, but we are not even discussing uh, these new technologies and it's not a yeah. widely spread that we know about it. And we are the ones trying to offer some solutions and I see very little of these people engage and it's uh, already another community. So uh, I would say my next step, uh, that's what I would like to do is like, I'm doing a lot of planter health, health, environment nexus, uh, gender, human rights, but then the next, I really want to bring this conversations about technology and how is this really disrupting uh, many of the solutions that we seem to propose. So that will be my next move <laughs> I'm announcing here. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, we are almost at 40, at 2.45, and as mentioned at the beginning, unfortunately, we have to cut it a bit short because Nicole is already preparing for our next appointment, which is just starting shortly after. So I, was, I am very thankful that she could make the time to be here. Thank you very much all again for being part. In particular, thank you, Nicole, for your presentation and hope to see you all again one way or the other. Bye. Thank you, everyone. It was a real pleasure. I hope we'll be in touch via email. <laughs> thanks, Akin. Thanks, Anita.